Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Julius. I'm a PhD student at the MPI for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen and also um, co-supervised in um, Cambridge by Adrian Weller and uh, at MPI by Bernhard. And I'm generally interested in causality and machine learning and everything in between. And um, I think Amir is gonna cover the first part, so I'll hand it off to him now. Great, thanks, Julius. Um, hi everyone, my name is Amir, and I am also a PhD student at the MPI for Intelligent Systems and at ETH in Zurich. Um, and my interests lie at the intersection of ethical machine learning and causality, and hence the topic of today's discussion, which is algorithmic recourse. So I'll start off by sharing my screen. Um, let me know if you cannot see this. Cool. Okay, so today we're talking about um, two papers on the topic of algorithmic recourse from theory to practice. And this is joint work with Julius, who we have on the line here, as well as my two supervisors, Bernard and Isabel. And we will be covering two papers. Um, the first one is algorithmic recourse from counterfactual explanations to interventions. And the second follow-up is a algorithmic recourse under imperfect causal knowledge, a probabilistic approach. So we start off with a case study. This individual, which we'll be seeing more of throughout the presentation, his name is Edward. He's 28 years old, has a salary of $75,000. Um, he's saved up 25 grand over the years. He's employed as a software engineer and is single. And he's thinking of buying a house. And after months of scrupulous savings and many open house viewings, he's finally found his dream home and is ready to place an offer. Um, but first he must visit a bank. And the bank may consult a system such as this one to decide whether or not Edward gets the loan or perhaps something like this, or maybe something even more complicated like this. And with more involved models, typically the system gains the ability to better model the nuances in the historical data. However, it comes at the cost of sacrificing its interpretability. And so naturally some questions arise for different stakeholders. For example, the bank may ask, what are the most influential features towards making this decision? Regulators or a governing body may ask, is the system acting fairly by relying on sensitive attributes such as age or marital status? And bank customers such as Edward who were denied the loan may ask, I didn't get the loan, why not? And what should I do to get it the next time apply? Now answering these questions is the concern of interpretable machine learning or XAI. So among the, the many definitions of XAI, we adopt the one by Doshi, Velez, and Kim, which is the ability to explain or to present in understandable terms to a human. And XAI, broadly speaking, has two goals. The first one being we need to understand why a particular decision is output from a model. And consequently, we need to recommend actions that would result in a desired output for that individual. One up and coming method that aims to achieve these goals is called counterfactual explanations, which are statements of the form, how the world would have had to be different for a desired outcome to occur. Um, for example, you could say if your salary had been 100,000 instead of 75, you would have been offered the loan. In this example, an explanation provided by the bank would inform Edward on the situation he should attain in order to get the loan. Now let's take a closer look at counterfactual explanations, see whether or not they satisfy the goals of XAI. So here's Edward again. He is a, our factual instance, X of F at time T naught, and he seeks an explanation for why his loan was rejected. If we look back in time, a counterfactual explanation would tell us that had the feature vector XF taken the values of XCFE, which is a counterfactual explanation, the classifier in this case not shown would have given you the loan. This is called retrodiction. If we use the same logic and look forward in time, assuming the world is stationary um, and the classifier doesn't change, then we could say at time t naught plus t, if your feature vectors it becomes x CFE, then this would also result in a favorable outcome. This is called prediction. But something is missing from this picture. In layman's terms, we could say that counterfactual explanations inform an individual where they need to get to, but not how to get there. So the recommendation is missing. And so we review that one of the primary objectives of explanations is as a means to help a data subject act rather than merely understand. 
And so the missing link in this diagram is this action here, which we refer to as algorithmic recourse, which corresponds to the set of actions the individual must perform to realize a desired situation. And so in the, the following slides and in our work, we first show that existing approaches fail in general settings to inform an individual how to get to where they need to go. And instead, we suggest an alternative formulation to achieve optimal and feasible recourse. So let's look at um, some of the previous works. And feel free to interrupt at any point if there are questions. OK, so now we go into the first work. And the problem setup is as follows. We have Edward. He's the individual seeking a loan. He's represented by XF. And the bank uses a classifier here, H theta. Um, it's a linear decision boundary in this example, and he's denied a loan. And we seek to help him understand how to resolve the situation. The original counterfactual explanation problem was formulated by Wachter et al. in 2017 as this optimization problem here, which sought to find the most similar individual, in this case, a feature vector, to the factual individual that seeks recourse. Now, these individuals, as shown in the green stars, would lie on the other side of the decision boundary. To shift the focus from just providing explanations to providing recourse actions, Ustan et al. in 2019 reformulated the optimization problem as follows, where now we optimize over the cost of actions that would result in a counterfactual instance on the other side of the decision boundary. This is visually shown as the two deltas that we see on the image. This reformulation allowed us to add additional constraints, in this case, feasibility constraints over the actions to account for the actionability of those features. For example, age cannot decrease or education degree can only be attained, or gender in specific applications or in most applications may be considered as immutable. However, this reformulation assumes that all the features can be modified in an additive and independent manner, which may not be very realistic. And so the question that we ask in this work is, do these shifts or deltas obtained from existing methods translate to optimal and feasible real world actions for recourse? And we argue that this question cannot be answered without considering the world in which the actions will be performed and the consequences of those actions, which we show that we model using an SCM. So to reason formally about actions and their consequences, we briefly first review some preliminaries. We adopt the SCM framework of Perl, which consists of a pair of structural equations and the distribution over background variables P of U. Um, as I'm sure this audience knows, the structure equations are a set of deterministic assignments, determining the value of each of the variables xr as a function of its direct causes or causal parents, x parents of r, and some latent background variable u of r. We further assume that the corresponding graph is a DAG and that it satisfies causal sufficiency, and so we do not consider hidden confounding. And also to conclude this preliminary, we know that a fully specified SCM entails three types of distributions corresponding to three rungs of the causal ladder. Specifically, when generating recourse actions, we aim to evaluate statements about a world in which a hypothetical intervention was performed, all else being equal for that single individual. And this perfectly aligns with the counterfactual distribution shown on the right-hand side, which is computing using the three-step process of Perl. Now, a side note I want to say here is that under some assumptions, and as we'll see in, in the upcoming slides, we can perform abduction exactly, and our distribution, our counterfactual distribution, coll collapses to a Kronecker delta, identifying the exact counterfactual instance of the factual instance corresponding to Edward subject to a hypothetical action. But first, let's go back to the question of whether or not counterfactual based recourse actions are optimal and feasible, and under what conditions they guarantee recourse. So let's look at the example of Edward in a bit more detail. Consider the following setting. Again, Edward um, is represented by this feature vector here where X1 is a salary of 75,000 and X2 is a savings. We consider a fixed predictor used by the bank. And we imagine further the causal relations between these variables where home seekers typically save 30% of their salary. And so this can be seen on the third line here where X2 is assigned 3 tenths of X1 plus the background variable. And you can see the corresponding graph on the right-hand side. In this setting, previous methods based on counterfactual explanations may return either of the two, uh, either of the two deltas that we see here, represented um, in the graph and represented by the green stars. 
a counterfactual based recourse action based on this optimal delta, delta star, would result in the point XCFE star. But we observe that there is a better solution, as shown by the blue star in the figure which only requires, in this case, a 14% 14, 14 relative effort on the variable x1 as compared to 33% on x1 or 20% on x2 in the case of the existing methods. And this is because um, the optimal action in the mint-based recourse, which is our approach, was identified by making use of the information about dependencies between variables. A change in x1 in this example on the salary after a year's worth of time would also amount to a change in the bank balance, collectively throwing the individual Edward on the other side of the decision boundary. Okay, so the example here shows that counterfactual based, um, counterfactual explanation based recourse actions are not optimal, but are they feasible? And to answer this, we need to understand what it means to do an action. So one way to interpret actions is as structural interventions on a set of endogenous nodes in the SCM. Um, here we can see that the action of a counterfactual explanation would be a do intervention on a set of variables where the set is determined by I. Now, the question is, which variables do we intervene on given the delta star that uh, previous methods give us? Now, um, we consider that for actions as interventions to guarantee recourse, meaning that the post-intervention individual arrives at this point on the bottom right, the X star CFE, the individual must intervene on a set of variables in I, where the set I may be any arbitrary subset of observed variables, as long as the intervention contains the variable indices for which delta star I is not zero. So we basically need to intervene and change the variables where delta star I says that a change needs to happen. But what happens to those variables that we do not intervene on? If they are non-descendants non of the set i, then this is okay because we expect them not to change as a result of the intervention. But if they are descendants of the set i, then they may consequently change in an unconsidered manner, sometimes throwing the individual too far on the other side of the decision boundary, or perhaps not even putting them on the other side, and so recourse can't even be offered in this case. And so, this example provides the insight for the following key result in our work, which is that counterfactual based actions in general guarantees recourse if and only if the set of descendants of the acted upon variables is the empty set. And in practice, of course, this is highly restrictive and so not so feasible. And thus, going back to the main question of our study, counterfactual explanation based recourse actions do not translate to optimal and feasible recourse. But this is only the first part of our study. Now we need to say how we actually resolve this. And so to solve this limitation, we propose to reformulate the recourse problem. This is the one from Osten et al. in 2019. And instead of finding the minimum cost shift, we aim to find the minimum cost interventions, and hence the name MINT, that would result in recourse. A key aspect of this reformulation as um, highlighted here in yellow, is that we find such interventions via computing the structural counterfactual, which directly accounts for actions as well as the consequences of those actions towards the final outcome. Now, we remark that while previous approaches do offer recourse in independent worlds, our reformulation extends the settings to general worlds governed by arbitrary SCMs. Okay, so now we've formulated the problem and now we need to solve this even more complicated optimization problem. We first note that um, we can derive a closed form expression for the highlighted constraint using Perl's three-step process for structural counterfactuals for the common family of additive noise models. Intuitively, what this expression on the bottom shows is that the counterfactual value of the ith feature, which is XSCFI, takes the value xif plus the delta shift if such a feature was intervened upon, and otherwise the value is computed as a function of both the factual and counterfactual values of its parents, denoted by P, the parents of iscf and the parents of if, meaning that the difference of what happened to the parents trickles down to, to the descendant nodes if they're not structurally intervened upon. 
Okay, and um, there are some experiments in the manuscript as well that we can also chat about, but we can return to that later. Now in the remaining slides, um, I would like to explore some more aspects of actions as interventions in, in the real world. And so one assumption that was made throughout the paper was that we consider interventions as structural interventions, where each intervention proceeds by unconditionally severing all the edges incident on the intervened upon node or intervened upon nodes, fixing the post manipulation distribution of a single variable to one deterministic value. Now, while intuitively appealing and powerful structural interventions are in many ways the simplest type of intervention. And as suggested by authors before us, their simplicity comes at a price, which is foregoing the possibility of modeling many situations realistically. Um, importantly, there's nothing inherent to an SCM that a priori determines the form, feasibility, or scope of an intervention. And I would like to emphasize this point that the standard tools of the SCM framework do not restrict an intervention on one variable. They do not say that age cannot be decreased either in the real world or hypothetically in a counterfactual. This is something exogenous to the model that we need to determine or an expert the field has to determine. And so the, the choice is really a form, feasibility, and scope of interventions should be delegated to the individual and to the context that it determines what the application is for. Um, here, I, I would just like to point out an example about the feasibility of interventions. So once we start thinking about the world in a causal manner and to think about actions as interventions, we're able to tease apart the definitions of um, actionability and mutability. Um, Whereas in previous works, they only differentiated between mutable and immutable variables, also known as actionable or non-actionable by a different name. For example, bank balance is actionable, but gender for the purposes of obtaining a loan is non-actionable. We can now describe a new form of variable, which is mutable, but non-actionable, such as credit score, where the intuition is that the credit score is not directly actionable by the individual, but it can change as a consequence of a change to its causal ancestors, for example, regular debt payment. And of course, we're assuming that no fraudulent action is happening here by someone directly intervening on the credit score. And so there's, there's a whole discussion on these three different aspects of real world interventions. And if anyone's interested, we can chat about that afterwards. So. Cool, so to wrap up the, the first paper, we studied the problem of algorithmic recourse, focusing on consequential actions rather than explanations. We showed through examples and in theory that recourse is not guaranteed in general using counterfactual explanation based actions. We argued that we should reformulate the optimization problem from finding nearest counterfactuals to finding minimum cost interventions that not only account for the actions, but also for the consequences of those actions. And finally, we provide an extensive discussion on the various aspects of real world actions as interventions. Now, the elephant in the room here is that this entire work assumes that we have full specification of an additive noise model-based SCM. And of course, this is a major practical limitation, um, which I will now hand off to Julius to discuss more. Should I close my sharing um, so you can start sharing? Yes, this? I think I might just be able to take over. Okay. Um, yes, so continuing from where Amir left off in this second paper, we try to address some of the more practical limitations of the um, causal reformulation of the recourse problem. Namely that um, the, what we saw so far relied on the assumption of a known and given SCM and in addition on the assumption of additive noise um, in order to be able to perform uh, abduction exactly and compute a single counterfactual for each um, factual instance and action. Before so, you continue, uh, um, I think you're sharing the, the non-keynote one. I think that's oh. fine too, if, if you want to fix that, but if not, I think it's fine too, it doesn't matter. Okay, wait, hold on a moment. Try that again. Right, now we're good? Yep, okay. thank you. Okay, 
So um, we saw this proposition how uh, counterfactual explanation-based um, actions are only valid in a world with causal relationships if the counterfactual explanation only affects um, variables which do not have descendants. So meaning that their changes do not propagate to any descendant variables. And um, this is sort of addressed by taking the causal model into account. And we now asked, um, okay, if we have a causal model and if the descendants of the acted upon variables are not empty, then um, can we still guarantee recourse? And uh, the second proposition or the first proposition in this paper is um, that this is not possible in general. So for the general class of SCMs, um, we can show that um, we cannot uniquely guarantee recourse and this can be proven by constructing two SCMs which cannot be distinguished empirically, so neither from observational nor interventional data. Um, but these two SCMs imply different counterfactuals. And we can uh, see that here, this is the specific example we used. I might not go through this in full detail, but the essence is that um, we have two different SCMs, MA and MB, uh, over three observed variables. They only differ in terms of the third structural equation, so the structural assignment to x3 as a function of x1 and x2. And in this specific case, you can already see this is not an additive noise model, clearly. Um, we have discontinuous indicator functions, we have multiplicative noise in the second equation. So, um, but that's the statement. In this general setting, uh, we can observe a factual instance, so for example, um, 1, 0, 0, then um, these two SCMs predict different counterfactuals for a hypothetical intervention on say X1. And so what this shows is that um, we might not be able to distinguish between such two SCMs, even though they apply different counterfactual outcomes. And so in, in this general setting, we therefore cannot guarantee recourse. Um, note also that um, the converse of the implication is not true. So we showed that um, you cannot guarantee recourse if they are not specified, but it's not true that the specification is sufficient to um, guarantee recourse. So, um, and this, you can see this also from this example, um, we can construct a different factual observation. So here, um, one, zero, one. And in that case, if we perform our abduction, we are not able to uniquely determine the value of U3, so the third exogenous variable. Um, we only find that it's larger than zero. And then if we try to use that to predict counterfactuals, we do not get a count, uh, point counterfactual as before, but a distribution. And so we can say that SCM specification is necessary, but not sufficient to guarantee recourse where by guarantee here, we mean um, guarantee with absolute certainty. And so this also motivates the probabilistic view that we take um, in the following, that is to not reason about um, guaranteeing recourse with absolute certainty, but try to provide more practical methods um, which achieve this with high probability. And so um, to start with a high level overview of the different approaches. So the first column here, um, the deterministic recourse is what Amir presented in the first part. So there we assume that the causal graph and causal, causal graph is known. We assume no hidden confounding. This is um, a general assumption throughout all of our work. We can discuss that later. And um, if you then also assume the structure equations to be additive noise models and they're given, then you can perform recourse in a deterministic way. But uh, now we, we sort of take this probabilistic perspective and we explore two, two different sets of assumptions which lead to different approaches. So in the first approach, I will talk about the individualized uh, notion of recourse. Uh, we will try to address the same counterfactual target quantity, namely the counterfactual outcome given a hypothetical recourse action. And in order for, um, being able to uh, perform this counterfactual reasoning given only data and our assumptions, um, we further restrict the set of SCMs to be an additive Gaussian noise model. And um, we will then use Gaussian processes to uh, average over a whole family of SCMs and thereby obtain a counterfactual distribution rather than a, a point counterfactual. 
So in some more detail, we assume that the structure equations are given by a nonlinear smooth function FR applied to the causal parents, uh, plus some additive Gaussian noise UR. And we uh, captured the smoothness assumption by placing this uh, GP prior over the FRs. And now our problem is that uh, if we are given a factual uh, observation, we can perform model averaging in a way to uh, obtain the first the posterior over these noise variables. And we can then translate this into a counterfactual distribution for um, actions that manipulate some of the observed variables. And this is possible here due to some nice properties of GPs and we have closed form expressions for these uh, in the paper, if you're interested in the details. So we then um, yet again reformulate the, the, the problem where um, it is similar to the form that Amir presented before, but now our constraints are of a probabilistic nature. So where before we had the constraint that the classification of the counterfactual outcome be on the other side of the boundary, since we saw that we cannot guarantee this with certainty, we now minimize the cost uh, of an action subject to the constraint that the expected value of the classifier, so this is in the second line, the expectation of age of the counterfactual outcome, be larger than some threshold, where this um, threshold composes uh, two terms. The first one being 0.5, which is just the decision boundary for a probabilistic classifier with outputs in zero one. And the second term is um, controlled by a free parameter gamma LCB. And it basically penalizes also the variation or the uncertainty. And as a whole, it can be interpreted as a lower confidence bound. So we are not just interested in the expected uh, outcome of the recourse action, but also in the uncertainty associated with that in the sense that um, since we want to achieve recourse with high probability, we want to penalize actions which might get us uh, over the boundary with 51% chance, but where we're very uncertain about this. Okay, so um, coming back to the second uh, type of approach. So uh, if we now, drop this assumption of additive Gaussian noise on the structural equations, and we do not make any assumptions about their specific form, we are no longer able to perform counterfactual reasoning without any SCM underlying it. And so in this um, second subpopulation based notion of recourse, we, um, we instead aim for a proxy quantity that is of an interventional uh, type. So on a sort of one rung lower on the ladder of causation. And in particular, we want to compute the, um, the average treatment effect conditional on some subpopulation that shares certain characteristics with the given individual. So we want to find actions that work well, not specifically for the given individual, which would be the individualized counterfactual notion, but that work well for um, a small group of similar individuals. And so in this second approach, um, we see, so you see already in the left in the diagram that we do not start from um, just the point of the factual observation, but there's now also this red cloud around it. This indicates that we consider the whole, um, a whole subgroup of similar individuals around Edward. So um, in this approach, we um, compute the conditional average treatment effect of an action for a subpopulation where we define the subpopulation by sharing the values of the non-descendant features. So those are the features which are neither intervened upon nor will change as a result of the action. So therefore we can simply keep them fixed. For example, uh, you can think of female engineers in their forties. So this would be the shared characteristics with the individual and then other variables will likely change as a result of the action that we consider. We then want to reason about this interventional distribution of all of the descendant variables, given that we condition on the non-descendants and we intervene on the remaining variables. And because we assumed a causally sufficient system, this um, distribution is straightforwardly identified as the product of these um, Markov kernels or causal conditionals of each of the descendant variables given its causal parents. 
And since we want to work with these kinds of interventional distributions, this motivates us to then um, learn these causal conditionals from data with some conditional density estimator. So here we choose to use conditional variation autoencoders or CVAEs um, for some reason that will maybe become a bit more clear later, but you could also pick um, other kinds of density estimators. And with these, we can then approximate these interventional distributions. And we can use this, uh, we can attempt to solve the subpopulation based um, recourse problem that has uh, pretty much the same form as the individualized problem on the previous slide, with the only difference that now the expected classification, so this expectation is evaluated not with respect to the counterfactual distribution, but with respect to the interventional distribution over the specific subpopulation of non-descendant attributes. So maybe as a small aside, um, this is something we also thought about a bit, um, to what extent this kind of CVAE model is um, purely interventional or whether it could also be interpreted as an SCM. So um, recall we learn the density of each variable given its causal parents with this kind of latent variable model where we have some, some latent Zs and that we then map through some uh, neural decoder to give us this implicit density. And now you could, in principle, um, interpret this as learning an approximate SCM where your latent variable Z are the exogenous U and your conditional decoders are the structural equations. But there's a problem with this uh, interpretation um, because we are here in a setting that is not very well understood from an identifiability perspective. So um, in the general case, we know that the structural equations are not identifiable simply given the causal graph and data. Now, specifically here, we have um, some additional restrictions, namely that the noise distribution is an isotropic Gaussian and the functions are neural networks. But we're not aware of any um, results for this particular setting. So it's not so clear in what extent, if you learn such a model, um, to what extent this combination of um, noise and decoders resembles the true structural equations in any way. And as a second unrelated issue, um, we can also not perform exact posterior inference in, in, VV, in VAEs or CVAEs. And so the abduction is not um, possible in exact form and instead we usually use the approximate posterior. So for that reason, we also um, in our experiments will see the use of um, sampling from the encoder, which implements the approximate posterior instead of from the prior. Um, and we refer to these as pseudo counterfactuals because it's not so clear whether they should be interpreted as, as real counterfactuals in any specific SCM. Okay, so this just as an aside, maybe because it's um, interesting from the causal perspective. Now, um, we saw these two different approaches um, for taking a probabilistic view on uh, algorithmic recourse within the causal framework. And we showed two different optimization problems corresponding to different sets of assumptions. And we now uh, still need to talk about how to solve or uh, yeah, address these optimization problems. So in either case, we want to minimize the cost subject to some constraint that the expected classification be larger than a threshold where the expectation is taken either with respect to a interventional or a counterfactual distribution of the descendant variables. Um, note that we have two different types of variables to optimize over here. So we need to both choose the intervention targets, meaning which variables we will intervene on, um, as well as the intervention values. So to which values we will actually fix these variables. And um, the optimization over intervention targets seems quite tricky because it's a combinatorial problem. And so if the set of variables is very large, then um, we might have to come up with some more sophisticated um, search procedures or so. In our case, we simply enumerate all uh, intervention targets. Um, but the intervention values, we can, um, we can also address with a gradient-based approach. So um, if they are not discrete, you might discrete, uh, discretize them and use a brute force search. But um, we also propose a gradient-based method. 
um, by first reformulating this constrained optimization problem above into an unconstrained one using a Lagrangian reformulation. And um, we then solve this um, saddle point problem where we want to minimize over the intervention values data for a given fixed set of intervention targets and maximize over the um, Lagrangian lambda. Um, and we address this with uh, gradient descent using the reparameterization trick by which we can um, get an unbiased estimator of the gradient um, by reparameterizing our distribution. And this is possible here because both the GP model, um, so Gaussian distributions are easily reparameterizable, and also the CVAE model is an implicit density model and thereby admits this kind of natural reparameterization. So um, that's how we go about solving the optimization problem. And I will hand back now to Amir to talk about um, some of our experimental results. Oops, one sec. Okay, uh, thanks, Julius. Um, if there's any questions up to this point, I mean, feel free to ask, or we can also discuss more towards the end. Okay, so all of this theory was shown. Does it actually work in practice? And to do so, we have a number of approaches, including proposed approaches and baseline approaches that we use to demonstrate results. Um, specifically, we look at eight different approaches, the first one being the M star, which is a counterfactual oracle, assuming we have full specification of the SCM. We have two baseline point-based approaches, M lin and M kr, which are point-based estimates of the SCM, where each of the parent-child relationships are learned using either linear or kernel ridge regression. And we have five probabilistic approaches, where the first two, MGP and MCVAE, are individualized approaches that um, approximate either the counterfactual or the pseudo counterfactual distribution. We have another oracle for the subpopulation base. In this case, it's Kate star. Um, and we also have two uh, subpopulation based approximate solutions, which are Kate GP and Kate CVAE, where they sample from the noise prior um, using either GP SCM or a CVAE fit model to each of the child parent relationships. Um, as for the settings that we consider, um, this is the general three variable model that, um, that we consider for the first half of our experiments. Um, uh, right now I'm only showing two of the three models that we discuss in our paper. We have some updated results, but it's not yet on archive. Um, so I'm only showing the linear SCM and the nonlinear additive noise model. Uh, in terms of metrics, we primarily use uh, the cost, the validity, and the lower confidence bound, where the cost is the L2 norm between the intervention value, theta, and the factual value or the original value of the factual instance, normalized according to the range of each of the variables. Validity is considered as the percentage of individuals within a population for which we're able to generate recourse actions according to each of these methods. And the lower confidence bound is, as we saw earlier, the expected value of the output of the model according to the counterfactual that we find minus this confidence to make sure that we're highly confident and on the other side of the decision model. Now, in the interest of time, we're going to suffice to only point out some trends regarding the effect of untestable assumptions, robustness of recourse actions, uh, some semi-synthetic demonstrations, and recourse guarantees. So let's start off with the untestable assumptions. We can see here in this, um, in all these numbers, and as we highlight, that probabilistic recourse approaches in green generally lead to more robust results than the point-based recourse approaches in blue, um, which lose in validity once their untestable assumptions are no longer met. In this case, for example, if you look under the nonlinear ANM columns, you can see the 52% validity and 98% validity when we um, are in a nonlinear additive noise model setting, but we are approximating the child parent conditionals using a linear 
um, regression model, naturally we expect this to fail. However, we can see that the um, both individualized and the subpopulation based probabilistic approaches are more robust and work generally across these two settings, as well as the new setting that we will present in the updated version of the paper. Okay, um, in terms of robustness, we can see that uh, subpopulation based approaches, as compared to their individualized counterparts, lead to lower validity at slightly higher cost. And this, this again makes sense because um, generally subpopulation based approaches are trying to achieve recourse for a whole group of individual rather than a single individual. And so we would expect that the cost be slightly higher to ensure that everyone in that group of individuals actually achieves recourse. Um, however, and importantly, subpopulation based approaches provide actions that are more consistent with their oracles. As we can see on the bottom right, corner of, of this uh, table, which we see that um, out of 50 different um, recourse actions that were generated, 40 and 46 of the subpopulation ones actually agree with their oracle. And this um, is opposed to perhaps the um, 25 and 20 that match the oracle in the individualized approach. And so there's slightly more robustness in the generated actions, and perhaps this might lead to better trust to, um, towards the system that's generating recourse. What, what do these numbers mean, if you go back mm -hmm. one slide? What does 50 mean for the star catties? So in this case, what we've done is that we've used the two oracles, Kate star and M star, to generate recourse. Uh -huh. And we ask how many of the generated recourse actions in the other methods actually intervene on the same nodes as the one that the oracle suggests. For example, if the oracle is saying that someone should increase their age in order to get a loan, and if that's the optimal action that they should do, then we would expect that the approximate solutions also suggest age to change rather than some other, some other feature. And so we're evaluating the robustness of recourse actions on these approximate solutions relative to their oracle. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I also ask if, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, no worries. because you don't see me, it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, do you have a, um, some hypothesis as to why uh, you see higher agreement with Kate Starr for uh, the subpopulation based versus the individualized? Like that's not intuitive to me. That's a reasonable question. Um, I'm trying to recall whether we had an explanation for this. Do you recall anything, Julius, from the paper? So I think you might argue that actions are, so for the individualized notions, you heavily rely on specifics of the individual. In particular, sort of everything rises and falls with the abduction. So if you infer a particular set of noise variables, then um, that might make some actions lower or like more effective at lower cost than others. Whereas um, I guess that maybe this mechanism is a bit less pronounced at the group level where individual variations and how your model fit um, captures those is maybe has less of an effect and therefore you could argue that the, the Kate approaches which look at a whole group of individuals are less prone to sort of these individual variations and therefore are more tend to agree with the Oracle more. So it's essentially an argument about the fact that counterfactuals are harder to compute <laughs> with high precision compared to uh, inter interventions. Yeah, I think you could say it like this, yeah. Okay. Okay, sweet. Uh, thank you, Julius. And thank you for and the question anymore. Sorry, could I actually just chip in with one quick question yep. related to, to the previous ones. in these columns at the right where we're counting the number of recourse actions that are a lot or aligned with the oracle um so there's 50 like right answers i mean want to know how many out of 50 it got is that basically true does it yes. always uh compute the same number of guesses 
like does it have 50 guesses and it either gets it right 100 percent of the time or something less than that is that how it works so maybe a small clarification here would be that um, the way that we define a right action in this sense is according to this this oracle mm -hmm. um, and our oracle is in this case evaluating optimal actions for 50 different individuals mm -hmm. and now we say that here's this alternative method that we propose for the same individuals, what would you suggest? Would you say intervene on X1 and X3 together okay. as the optimal with okay. these specific values? Or would you say something else? And so we need to be a bit careful about saying if this is the right, it's right according to our optimization and our definition of costs. And within this context, this is the optimal action that we receive from solving the Oracle, solving the optimization given the Oracle assumptions. Did that help answer your question? I think David stuck. Yeah, I think he froze at the very end. <laughs> that happened before today, so I'm just... Oh, okay. I thought my answer was just so mind-boggling. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Okay. It blew his mind. No, I'm okay. sure he will join again. But I do, I do have one question. So, um, so the Oracle is M star, right? So we get 50... Obviously, the Oracle on the Oracle is 50 out of 50, right? Yes. That's, uh, and then the Kate star is, what, what is Kate star? Um, because Kate star, Kate, uh, mm -hmm. Kate star is an Oracle on the... So Kate star is, is the same thing as M star in this case, but we don't sample from, we, do, we don't store the true noise variables that were used to generate the data. We only sample from the prior distribution of the noise variables. I see. So it's not performing abduction. No, it's not performing yeah. abduction. But Kate star is the interventional oracle. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, no, exactly. And so the interventional oracle on the M star oracle only gets 13 out of 50? Yes, that's also a peculiarity here where they don't necessarily agree with each other. Of course, one completely ignores, the, one has full specification of everything, including the exact values of the noises for each individual in the, in the set of 50, whereas the other doesn't. Hmm. Okay. This is, uh, is you, you said this, uh, is this, uh, you said these are new results or they're in the second paper? Um, no, so the, we, we have some additional results for the third type of SCM that is not shown here, which is um, no longer an additive noise model. It's a completely yeah. nonlinear um, SCM where the noises are also multiplicative and non-additive. Um, we're just not showing the results here. The, the ones that you see on the far right two columns are for um, the linear SCM in this case. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to the next set of experiments. And I apologize for these bars on the slides. I'm not sure how they remained in, in here. Anyway, so we have, um, in addition to the three variable synthetic um, experiments that we ran, we ran on a semi-synthetic seven variable model that is inspired by the German credit UCI data set. In this case, we have A is gender, I'm sorry, A is age, G is gender, Education level is E, loan amount is L, the duration of the loan is D, the income level and savings are also represented by I and S respectively. And to demonstrate a more realistic example, we also following the discussion from the previous paper where we have um, non-actionable variables. Here we say that age, gender, and the duration of the loan are non-actionable from the individual's perspectives because the duration of the loan is something that is set by the bank according to the individual situations. This is the setting that we assume. And we can see that the SCM that we're considering includes both linear and nonlinear relationships as well as different types of variables and noise distributions. And so supposedly it's a general type of SCM that we aim to generate recourse for. Now we can see that, oh, that's why the bars were there. Um, we can see similar trends as the synthetic case, showing that we can handle, um, showing that there is a consistency in the results for the individualized probabilistic approach that we have highlighted here. Um, and also importantly, we show that we can handle both differentiable and non-differentiable classifiers 
what's non, not shown here is that the way that we solve these optimization problems is both using the gradient descent approach that Julius mentioned as well as brute force. Um, brute force was used for random forest in the third set of columns and gradient descent was used for linear logistic regression and MLP based models. And um, one other surprising fact about these results is that we can see that individualized approaches, um, as highlighted, are performing well in all of the settings with 100% validity and the lowest cost, um, suggesting that perhaps the semi-synthetic experiments that we ran here were not that difficult because um, in the case of MGP and MCVAE, there are some, or, or in the case of MGP specifically about additive noise, um, if we run on a more complicated SCM that violates this assumption, we should see those results drop further in case of validity and, and leading to higher costs. Okay, so finally we investigate the effect of a controllable hyperparameter where we, which we call the conservativeness hyperparameter or the gamma for gamma LCB. And we recall our proposition that recourse can only be guaranteed if the true SCM is fully specified and known. However, the results here, um, so in addition to that proposition, the results here show that we can, using this single hyperparameter gamma LCB, uh, we can control the trade-off between validity and cost, where lower values of gamma correspond to lower validity and also lower cost and vice versa. Higher values of uh, gamma would be higher validity at higher cost. And so the main takeaway here is that our probabilistic recourse approaches are not only more robust, but also allow for controlling the trade-off between validity and cost using this, this hyperparameter. As a take-home message, um, while in the first work we showed that recourse is not guaranteed in general using counterfactual explanations, in this follow-up work, we show that recourse can only be guaranteed under perfect causal knowledge. Um, in practice, probabilistic approaches can be used to relax our assumptions to give recourse with high probability. And there's an inherent trade-off between the kind of assumptions that we're willing to make and the level of individualization, specifically if we don't assume a particular form in the SCM we can no longer provide individualized recommendations and we have to go to more subpopulation based recommendations. Um, there are a number of interesting directions for future work, which we hope to have inspired the, the audience here to explore, um, including extensions to heterogeneous features beyond real world ones um, and to explore more efficient optimization over intervention targets. Um, we would also like to further relax our assumptions to account for confounding variables and or partially specified causal graphs. And um, we might also be interested to uh, take inspiration from causal definitions of fairness for recourse and to explore the intersection of these two, these two concepts. Um, finally, I'd like to go back to where the story started. We started with Edward and the bank. And initially prior to our work, our, prior to our work um, real world recourse could only be guaranteed suboptimally and or infeasibly in independent worlds. Our first work, we showed that one could guarantee recourse, um, but only if the entire SCM was known. Uh, and after the second work, one could guarantee recourse with high probability if only the causal graph were known. And of course, this isn't just a story about Edward and definitely not a story just about bank loan approval. There are countless of scenarios where algorithmic systems are making consequential decisions for humans. And we hope that these works are one positive step towards providing agency, recourse, and ultimately trust between humans and machines. Thank you very much for your attention.